everybody. Welcome to this episode of Behind the Deal uh, at, from Ventures. Uh, we're really excited to talk about our latest investment uh, in Daytona. And here we have Yvonne, the CEO and co-founder with us. Yvonne, share a little bit about, you know, what is Daytona? Um, how did you get to building this company at this point? You know, how did you uh, ultimately think about fundraising? Uh, lots to talk about. Thanks for having me, uh, Peter and Kevin. Thanks for the support um, in Daytona as well. Really quickly, because the question you asked is super, super long. It's like 15 years long, um, it's a 15 <laughs> year long answer. But basically Daytona is what we call a dev environment manager. The idea is that right now spinning up a dev environment is like starting a car in the 1900s. Like you have to do all these tedious tasks to get up and running. Um, but now with Daytona, just like starting a car today, it's pushed to start. Um, and you're off to the races. So the idea is that uh, we really feel that it's absurd that you can, you know, press a button and move a car, but you can't, you know, pre-install libraries and get everything set up um, as you need it to be. Can you share a little bit about how did you get into, you know, trying to solve this problem in the first place? Uh, as you mentioned, it sounds like this is a very long journey. Uh, I'd love to hear a little bit about, you know, going way back. Uh, how did you get obsessed about this problem? So way, way, way back, uh, 2009 is the year uh, and my co-founder then and now, uh, Vedran, he's working as a CIO at, his, at a bank and I have a different company and they're a client of ours. And I come to his office and he shows me this thing, which is like a white screen notepad looking FTP connection, you know, sort, sort of browser based editor. And he's like, look at this thing. I'm tinkering with it. And I'm like, dude, this is like the next thing. Like everything is going to the cloud. Everything's going to be browser based. This is awesome. He's like you're an idiot. Like this is not happening. <laughs> and it's like, yes, it is. No, it isn't. And we knew ourselves well enough that we're sort of like, you know, spitballing there. And he's like, you know what? Here you go. Here's 50% of like, whatever this nothing is like, go like make this into whatever it is. And so I took that to heart. I still had a different company. And then the afternoons, you know, we were, we we're hacking at this thing, which we then called PHP anywhere. And we did it for, as a hobby for two years, technology was not there. We couldn't make anything work. We were thinking about doing syntax highlighting in ActionScript, which was part of Flash. So this was, mm -hmm. luckily we didn't do that. Web 2.0 came around, we were able to do things in the browser and we renamed it to code anywhere because now it's not just PHP, it's like all the programming languages in the world. And so that's how we started Code Anywhere Incorporated. Um, and we did that for a, quite a few years, but it was super, super um, early. No one was talking about, you know, remote development at all. Ultimately, we ended up doing different things. And now fast forward to about 18 months ago, we restarted the engine to do something similar, not the same, but, you know, similar space called Daytona. Um, after the learnings um, that we had there and the market sort of like got into the position where we thought it was back then. Um, and that's how we kicked off Daytona. Maybe take us back, you know, how you ended up working on Daytona from previously doing Shift, doing Code Anywhere also. We'd love to just get the broader founder background. As you mentioned, I founded a uh, developer conference called Shift. It's like a 5,000 in-person developer conference, six stages. We close airports and people drive Porsches there to have cocktails free. It's a super summer party type um, conference on the Mediterranean coast. And so I started that as a way to give back. The reason I actually started Shift, it was, I started it in 2012 or 13, something like that, um, because with Code Anywhere at that time, we went to conferences trying to raise money because I didn't know how to meet VCs back then. And I thought they were at conferences, which they were, but none of them invested in us. I wouldn't have invested us at that time as well. Um, but it's like, oh, like I met all these people I met these conferences, they're great. And this is the post 2000, you know, 2008, nine, when sort of the, the economy sort of crashed, especially in that part of the world, everything was very, very dark. And you go to these conferences and they're super high energy and everyone sort of um, enjoys going to these conferences. Like, oh, why don't we like bring these people to our home city and sort of create this conference. And so I created that um, conference, which ended up losing money for like two years, three years, whatever it was, um, and ended up like, oh, we have like, Code Anywhere going sort of okay. Like, why not make it like the Code Anywhere developer conference? Um, and that's what we did for two years. And then the conference ended up being more successful than Code Anywhere itself. And then ended up focusing um, on the conference and growing that business for a couple of years. Um, and so we grew that to about 1,500 people, three conferences a year. Um, and then it got acquired by a company called Infobip, which is a competitor of Twilio. 
Um, InfoBip is one of their biggest competitors. And I became the chief developer experience officer in that company. And I was supposed to stay there for four years. And so being in that sort of larger company, learned a lot of things, helped them grow that as well. But I actually left a bit earlier to start Daytona because there was such a pull in the market for the solution that we were building. And so I sort of ended up being full circle where, you know, I started this thing with Code Anywhere in my, in 2009, ended up doing a conference, which you learn community building around developers, then going to this large company that sells top down, they need a bottom up, learning how it works in the enterprise, and then being sort of pulled back into this um, whole scenario of, you know, managing dev environments. So you started Code Anywhere relatively in like, you know, 2009, and then you started Daytona in 2022? Yeah. Uh, in 2023. 2023. It's 2024. Um, yeah, huge, huge shift. I mean, you, when you started Code Anywhere, Docker didn't exist. You know, Kubernetes certainly didn't exist. GitHub Everything was barely a, and... GitHub was barely a thing. GitHub was like a very nascent thing at the time. Yeah. The the the, the you you have basically lived not to, not to age you, but the world has changed profoundly in the last you know 14 15 years what did the state of the world look like when you started thinking seriously about daytona it is odd the way that things happen all these products have been created to make things easier um, but it's actually a lot lot harder now because when we were creating software back in the day you spun up an ide that's why they're called ide integrated development environment because everything was there you just spun it up like JetBrains or visual studio whatever you did you wrote code and you hit run and it ran, like if the code worked, obviously, right? Um, today, like that is not how the world works. Today, you have so many things that you have to set up um, for it to actually work. And that's why the IDs today for them, like, yes, JetBrains is one, but the most popular is Visual Studio, which is Visual Studio Code, sorry, which is essentially a very bulky text editor. It's not an IDE because the ID, the DE is actually on your machine or hopefully in Daytona, right? A lot about me, I, we didn't get a chance to actually introduce y'all in the sense of the firm and maybe background of you two. Um, and then we can get into why you invested in Daytona. So yeah, of course, happy to go first. Um, we're very much early stage lead investors, uh, investing in you guys, leading your $5 million seed round. That's our bread and butter. Uh, and we do that in a very concentrated manner. Each partner here will do two new investments a year, maybe three, if it's a busy year, it's all about sticking with the founders all the way to the end. Uh, and you all see in our portfolio a wide swaths of different industries and company types, et cetera. Um, I really started off looking at a lot of vertical specific developer tools and infra, uh, particularly in healthcare and games, given that's what I studied and worked in, given I've been a gamer all my life. Uh, and I've spent, been spending a lot more time on horizontal tooling over the last couple of years. And, and frankly, a lot of that is thanks to Peter. You want to introduce yourself? Um, yeah, sure. I, I started my career at Venmo. I was an early engineer there. I saw them go from like 35,000 active monthly users to 2 million. Um, I just got super lucky to be able to start my career there. Um, but I, I've spent most of my career since as a founder. Uh, I started an AI travel assistant company uh, back in 2014. Uh, we were basically trying to give every corporate traveler their own personal AI travel agent. Uh, we sold that in 2016 to a company called TradeShift. And I, I love being a founder. I, I wanted to do it again. So I started another company in 2019 called Macro. It was a workflow automation startup trying to reinvent the company checklist. Three and a half years just trying to find product market fit. And unfortunately, as it often happens, we didn't get it. Um, you know, I, I love being a founder. It was my favorite job in the world. Um, but I sort of had reached a point in life where I, I didn't want to be a founder anymore. So I found myself uh, gravitating towards uh, what I saw to be the next best thing, uh, which was to join venture. And um, you know, I was lucky enough to find an opportunity to work with folks up front. So I've been here for a little bit more than a year, uh, focusing mainly on, on dev tools, infrastructure. Just uh, I get to I get the privilege to be able to work with folks like you. You guys are actually a really good case study for you know certainly what not just I think what we look for, but what a you know sort of lead investor looks for in a company kind of at this early stage. Uh, and we try to break it down into a couple different things. And there's what we call founder market fit. Um, that is arguably the most important. Um, at the end of the day, you know, much of a company, especially in these early days, is really about the founding team and why they have such a unique vantage point, a unique obsession with trying to solve this problem that, that they're, they're going after. I think, as you alluded to, you almost got pulled into Daytona. Um, and I think the environment is very different these days, right? A developer 
these days, you know, can be working on multiple projects, even within the same company, they be contributing to different products um, and to spin up and have the right config for a dev environment that works for each of those, let alone dealing with all the third party integrations and API calls they're making. And you multiply that by, you know, number of developers, number of projects at a single company, uh, you can imagine how that can get very unwieldy very quickly. And, and frankly, there is a lot of you know, pull in a lot of demand to how do we manage that, you know, at the company side in a seamless manner with centralized governance, you know, with a lot of fine grained controls, which you guys offer, right? Like you guys allow for whether it's cloud, whether it's, you know, self-hosting on-prem, like you guys can allow for any and all of those options. And then frankly too, you know, from the developer's vantage point as well, like I don't want to think about, you know, how to maintain my dev environment, making sure that it works or lobbying a ticket over to the DevOps team or the platform team when something breaks down. Like, I just want to be able to work when I want to work uh, in a fast and efficient manner. And so, like, I think that's that's frankly what Daytona promises and what we believe is very much needed, you know, and, and frankly, what I, we think developers are also ready, ready to adopt. That kind of alludes to kind of the second thing we look for, which is really timing, right? At the end of the day, venture investment in the right thesis, but the wrong timing is also just the wrong investment decision. Uh, and you know, we look as much as we can for signals, whether it's from potential customers, from you know, open source, you know, developer adoption, um, all of these things to try to understand like, is now the best time to start this company, right? So if you want to boil it down is, is now the best time and why are these guys the best guys uh, you know, or gals to go after this problem? Those are kind of primarily the two things we look for um, when we're making an investment this early. One thing I heard from someone, I don't know, it might be you guys, I don't remember who said it, but it's like, why do you have the right to run, the, like, to take over this market? Like, someone asked me, and it's like, mm. as a founder, yeah. like, do you have an answer why you specifically have the right to do this? Which is a very, like, powerful question, which aligns with what you're saying. So what I heard is, like, as an investor, you're looking for founder product fit, like, exactly why can you do that? And someone else, timing is there, there as well. Is there anything else that you sort of look at Daytona in general, like to, to de-risk and say, oh, this is like a good enough, then you go into the deeper due diligence, whatever it may be, um, when you look at a company to invest in? One of the things that amazed us about what you guys have done is, uh, you know, you sought out to build an open source uh, product, right? Like you wanted the community to be involved. You wanted this thing to have some semblance of adoption and acceptance from the community, right? Uh, and that's, you know, something that it takes real effort. Uh, it's not something that you throw out there and things will magically work. And so even though you're an early stage company, early stage product, um, and you know, maybe a fortune 500 company will be a long sales cycle and not quite ready to adopt you guys. And that's not something we look for at a C stage, right? But at the same time, we can see the signals amongst months like, how powerful is this just for an individual developer? And then we go up a little, how powerful is this for a small team? How powerful is this for a large team, right? And you guys were able to show, frankly, a lot of that you know, traction and adoption, uh, you know, especially for where you guys are at, you know, 18 months into the company. And so again, what the actual specific traction is differs a bit by company, by what they're tackling, uh, but we do, do look for a little bit of that as well. Yeah, y Yvonne, maybe, maybe we could dive into sort of how you think about um, who you're building for. You know, you're not the only uh, player in this market. There is sort of rising competition here. How do you think about uh, the market that you're going after, who you're building for, how Daytona differentiates from what else is out there? Sure. I mean, uh, we really, when we started, we were very much, as Kevin said, it's not we were sort of pulled in. We were very much pulled in. Like I was... I had another job, still had another year and a half, like on, on stock to vest. And I was actually planning another company in a completely different space. I did not want to do this anymore. I was like, I was <laughs> done with dev tools. I was like done. But then you get like these calls from like analysts, like all the analysts called us up. Like, what are these CDs, browser based? I'm like, what are these things? Because we were so long in the market, they want information because people were asking about them. And then you have like, acquisition talks with like nothing to show for it. Um, like not, not nothing, but it's like very much not what we have today, right? It's like very much like MVP, you know, have large companies like the largest companies calling you. And so some of them got to a point where it was maybe there was some super interest, some maybe freckled out, but like just having that conversation there was very interesting. And then you have actually companies like very large companies who are like saying, oh, we need something like this. Can you build this, right? And so when you have like all these things happening in a very short time frame, we're talking about like two months, like all this inbound happening, it's like something is happening in the market. And we're like, okay, maybe we actually try this 
one point, the reason we ended up kicking off is like the team was tinkering with this new idea, which is Daytona. And we actually got a term sheet to sell the thing, like a full term, like it was there on the table. And it's like, we have to sign this and sell this thing, or we have to say no to this amount of funds. And so it was not insignificant. It wouldn't be an amount that would be in a TechCrunch article, but it's still, you know, a number that you have to sort of calculate. And so when me, Vedran and Goran, um, Goran being the third co-founder is like, if you all say no to this, cause I was the easiest for me to say yes or no. If you say no to this, like then we're building this thing. Right. And they're like, let's build this thing. And so that was sort of the pull, um, to actually build the company and build this product and the product and the pull came from large enterprise. It's like, and when we actually looked at the market, we didn't see the market addressing it that well. We saw a couple of players that were addressing segments of the market, uh, but no one, no one was addressing it as a whole. And we found a very big actual same word difference spelled like hole in the market, very big opportunity that we can tackle. And so we actually started as an enterprise first product, even us as engineers in the company is like, you have a handful of customers, but the amount of feedback is very small. It takes a long time, like for the large enterprise to actually, they try it out and they're spinning it up and the engineers, by the time the engineer replies to their, you know, manager or admin and that admin sends you a request and that request gets injured. It's a very slow feedback loop. And so it, we were discussing how to open source it. Um, and other competitors have open sourced their entire product, which is very large product that you need a cluster to run. And so my co-founder Vedran was very adamant of like saying, this makes no sense to the individual contributor. Like what can we give to individual developer to have the same, you know, magical experience, mm -hmm. but really small and helps them out. They don't want to have to spin this you know, whole cluster up. And we were thinking about like licensing, cut off the user experience, whatever. It took us nine months to figure this out. And we made a very sort of clean, what we think it cut off, like the developer experience is open source in the single little binary that you can execute. And the developer has that same experience. And we launched that March 6th. And like, as we mentioned at the beginning, two days later, there was 3000 stars. Like, and that is sort of where everything kicked off. And we were confident that people would like it, but this was really showed like the market wants this. And internally as the team, everyone now, I don't want to say work harder, but everyone enjoys working more because the entire market is now, you know, you have like PRs and issues and people are downloading it and you have all this feedback and signal in the space that we are not crazy and this is actually something that needs to be done. I'm going to ask you a sort of an interesting question, which is when you think about stewarding an open source project, are there any projects or leaders in the community that you take inspiration from? There's so many people that we take inspiration from, from bits, like segments uh, of it. I don't think that there's one that we sort of like copy paste into what we're doing. We were also very recently at a open source founder summit. And it was actually a very big revelation to us because this is our first open source project that we've actually done. Like we've consumed open source, but we've never run open source, which is a very different, different thing. And it was very interesting that deciding in how, what to open source, what segment of the product, the whole product, the part of it, whatever, like where that cutoff is and the license yeah. that you use is a very, very complex question. And we found that a lot of founders get into it more altruistically it's like, oh, this is this cool thing. And let's put it out there. Not thinking about consequences that happen later on. There's companies that we look, look at for inspiration of, let's say how they've created a community, like super base. Awesome. Like the founder is also an angel in Daytona, like what they've done with the community launch weeks. Now everyone does launch weeks, but they, yeah. they've been killing it. I think it's just mm -hmm. like, it's amazing what they've done. And I love to look at what they're doing, but the, the way they've open sourced their database is just basically all there. And they have a hosted version that they charge for. GitLab, super business, great the way they made it. It's like uh, open core, the core is there. But we think it's sort of, the community doesn't like that. The community actually hates, I mean, people say, I hate open core. Now, I have no opinion on that, whatever. But how do you create a community around that, right? If people don't like that. So there's a lot of things. We think that GitLab did a great job in the way they split what the core is from the product. But we took it a step further where we actually split the core from the proprietary product so that doesn't confuse or doesn't conflict the actual mm -hmm. consumers of open source. They only see what's open source and that's all they actually really need in 
for that persona itself. So maybe going back to earlier, you were talking about, you know, the founder journey and fundraising and how challenging those things can be. Love to hear a little bit about, you know, how you sought through fundraising, you know, getting to this kind of first equity round. What was that process like for you? Sure. Uh, just, just going a step back before we did the seed round, which you guys led, we also did a sort of pre-seed round. And so the way we did that first was super strategic because of what we've done historically, we knew that like Daytona is basically a new way of work. And so how do we get information about this new way of work that it is now this time around looking at, you know, 15 years ago, not an idiotic thing to do, but it makes sense. I mean, we had inbound like signals, but how do we message that to, to the larger community? And basically we got a bunch of angels, um, that was the majority of first round. So founder postman, founder of honeycomb, uh, super base, and you know, just a bunch warp, just a bunch of like great dev tool founders. And so that's how we got the first round together. And I'm sure that that helped also when we did the launch of the open source and whatnot, just because of the awareness and the signaling, all of these things. Now, when we were thinking about like the seed round, it was also very much as much as I've consumed, you know, YC's videos, talk to other founders. We were in tech stars with our old company. Like, this time around, it's like, you have to structure it. Fundraising is also sales. Like in this sense, you're selling your company. Yeah. You're not selling the product, but it's sales. And so when we were thinking about fundraising, I've also read a bunch of how people sort of do these things. And when you're fundraising, it takes a bunch of energy. And so um, post the pre-seed, we talked to a bunch of people. That's where I met Peter actually in New York, just randomly. I think I reached out on Twitter. There's other people that after you announce a raise, you always get inbound. And so I locked a, a sort of two, three weeks close to the end of the year, beginning of 2024, and just like met a bunch of investors. Then sort of like shut that down, back to work, you know, grinding, 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 and then sort of set some calls later on. When we decided to launch the open source, which is beginning of March, it went great. Like first person out the gate was Peter. Like I DM is like, you should raise now, like this, you should raise something. Like, and so he was the first person, like, I wasn't sure we were going to like work with you in the end, but it ended up you being first. And then you ended up being, and the whole thing actually, it's actually very short. I believe it took three weeks from start to term sheet. So from Peter's message to signing a term sheet, I think it was three weeks. And so I think that was actually pretty good on our part. And you guys ran a really efficient process and you know, you didn't mention this, but you know, you took you probably talked to 30 plus investors, like to your point, it is, you know, really a lot of work to go do a fundraise properly. Um, if it weren't for all the prep work you did before, you know, at least getting to know some of the investors first, having some of that, you know, initial uh, relationship building to maybe borrow a phrase from my partner, Mark, you know, connecting dots right, to yeah. ultimately form a line. Like uh, you want to run an efficient process like that. Um, you really have to have, you know, some seeds already planted to be able to ultimately, you know, get to an outcome in an efficient manner. Yeah, it's really hard. And I see that with the conversations, any investor that within your first call is when you're raising, I don't know the stats, uh, but I feel that those conversations are much harder to get to a close or close to versus when you've already had the conversation. So yes. it is very much lines, not dots, because when Peter and I talked the first time, like we had a certain amount of revenue, like the next time there was like almost double the revenue plus like all this traction. So it's like, this, I, my assumption is actually, I'll let Peter say what his assumption, like what, what that was. Well, well, I think, I think you're exactly right. You know, like when you, when you build up a relationship with a founder, you're basically doing two things from our perspective. One is you're basically setting the foundations of a relationship that hopefully, you know, gets to expand outwards into us building a company as, as partners. Um, but the other thing that you're doing is sort of providing some benchmarking for us as far as like what your progress looks like. So when I saw you in, you know, I don't know, was it the summer of 2023? Um, so almost a year ago now. And then, you know, we spoke maybe several months later and had a couple of conversations throughout the year. Uh, it, it was not lost on us um, that we were seeing a curve. Um, and we were starting to see things starting to work for the company. So seeing that progress, you know, we don't take that for granted. Most company outcomes are pretty flat. Um, and so in large part, we're betting on trajectories. And we could see that just by virtue of having, you know, built uh, a relationship with you and having different uh, touch points uh, throughout the course of that year. One thing I have to say for a lot of founders, and now as, you know, I'm older, more and more I ask you is like, a lot of people don't, nourish those relationships with VCs. I had, you know, people reach out, oh, I'm going to be in the Bay area. Do you know people like I can meet now because we're raising now, 
It's like, well, mm-hmm. you know, that doesn't make sense. So you do have to do your homework. And I have to say, and I, some people, I've actually showed this to people. I, can, I haven't showed you all, but I do have a, like a notion sheet before I actually went and did Daytona, which everyone that ever mentioned CDE, cloud development environment or remote development, I put in there, be it an investor, mm-hmm. be it a employee, be it whatever. And I tried to reach out to as much people as I can just to talk, you know, what's your opinion on this? And that does take time. But when you do that, then you actually know you're talking to someone that makes sense. So maybe last question from me, what were you looking for in an investor? You clearly worked with others before you worked with angels as well. Like you said, you raised capital before, like what were you looking for this time around? When you're looking for someone to work with long-term, um, it's very, 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 very important that you work with someone that has actually done this before um, on one hand. So like in a sense, like upfront as a fund, is a quote unquote serious fund. Like you all have done this before and you know what, how, you know, companies evolve and what are founder issues and what actually makes sense. You have a lot younger, I think they're called emerging funds. Some of them might have experience, some might have not. And when they don't have experience, like alignment of expectations is quite different. So that is one of the things. There's also one thing called like too much signaling in the sense of like, you want to have a fund as well that is a good signal to you. So it's like, do the people know what they're doing? Have they done it multiple times? Does the fund signal that as well? Can the fund connect us or help us in, in the manner that we need? And I have to say this, and I'm going to say this in public, by the way, just Kevin, I, so when I did my, what's it called research on you and did the, 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 well, the reference calls. Yes. So one of the people said, you're going to be on the Midas list like that, like this guy's going to be on the Midas list. That was, that was, that was, but I'm just saying that's yeah. So I'm saying (laughs) that is out there. And so, and another thing that other people said also as well uh, for you, because we, we haven't mentioned this, but you know, Kevin is on the board of Daytona now, which means Kevin can, you know, have, has voting rights and all those things. It's like, how is he like a person to work with? But everyone said that you are the partner, the board member, which is like, no bullshit. I won't like, you know, mess with you very lean going, very, you know, salute driven. And he's mm-hmm. the person, the way they said it is Kevin is the person that, you know, if you need help, you can call him at midnight. He'll answer the phone, do that. But when you don't need him, you don't feel like you have a board member there. And so outside of that and the Midas list thing, um, it seemed like, okay, these people check all the boxes, right? Um, you're, you're very kind and we certainly hope that we can actually live up to, uh, you know, those things that, that you mentioned, uh, you know, it hasn't been that long, but you know, to Peter's point, like we've actually gotten to know each other over the last month, nine months. And now that we're, you know, working much more closely together, it's been, it's been a phenomenal start and, and we're very excited to, to support you guys all the way, you know, all the way through the entirety, you know, of the Daytona journey, uh, maybe to end a bit on Daytona, you know, what, uh, how can people find out about you? You know, are you guys hiring? Uh, how do individuals find out about you? How do enterprises? find out about you uh, absolutely so a bunch of ways to find out about daytona um website daytona io but i also always point everyone the github repository is everything from there you can get to you know our slack channel which have more and more people coming in the events we, we put up some events for dev tool people if you want to just join and hang there's no we don't sell anything just like come and, and meet depending on when someone's watching this it'll change but definitely there's a careers page looking for people to help us along the journey but basically very transparent becoming a full open source company which we want so everything's on github out in the open so you can see the code the issues the tickets the jobs the links the slack everything is on github.com com slash Daytona IO. Awesome, Yvonne. Uh, thank you so much for, for joining us on this uh, episode of uh, From Behind the Deal. Um, Peter and I are, are thrilled that, you know, you picked us to be your partner and uh, we hope to live up to, um, you know, all the things you said. Great to have you on board and like looking forward to, you know, progressing in the same trajectory that we've been or a bigger trajectory than we've been yes. um, before. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Awesome.